This is Living and Loving Herbs Podcast. This episode is brought to you by farmtobath.com, where our bath and body products are inspired by nature. Farm to Bath makes beautiful handcrafted goat's milk soaps, body and room sprays, sugar scrubs, salves, balms, body oils, using the herbs, flowers, fruits, and vegetables grown in our gardens. There are no preservatives, additives, dyes, or fillers. We use sustainable growing practices that are chemical and GMO free. So make sure you check out farmtobath.com. This episode is brought to you by My Garden Journal, a how-to garden book for kids. Gardening is a learned skill and everybody has to start somewhere. This journal provides the best way to improve your gardening skills to ensure more success and fewer failures. The intent of this journal is to simultaneously teach basic gardening techniques while providing a place to record your journey with important information about the how, when, and where to grow food and flowers. There are suggestions on themed gardens such as a Harry Potter garden, a young chef's garden, or a monarch butterfly superhero garden for budding naturalists and a place to either sketch or photograph your plants to remember their appearance in the next growing season. You'll be amazed at how much you'll learn about journaling about your garden. This book is available in paperback and ebook formats. You can find it in most retail and online stores such as Amazon, Barnes & Noble, draft to digital Kobo, Google iBooks, and local libraries. If you don't find the book, please ask them to order it for you. It is available. If you don't want to wait for the paperback book to arrive, you can download a printable version directly from me at my author website, brendajsullivanbooks.com. That's B. R E N D A J S U L L I V A N B O O K S dot com. Click on the picture and scroll down to the bottom for the PayPal link and follow the prompts. And while you're there, check out all our other books available. Hello, I'm Brenda Sullivan, and this is Living and Loving Herbs podcast, where I discuss different ways you can use herbs, whether it's using them for health purposes, culinary purposes, growing it in your garden, using it in bath and body products, or creating a chemical-free home. I'll share with you its traditions and history, because who doesn't like a good story? If I find a good book related to the subject, resources that might be helpful, I'll share them with a link under book recommendations and reference links found in the show notes. The goal of this show is to demystify herbs, their uses, and make it easier for you to incorporate them into your daily life. Today, we're talking about gardening for newbies, seeds, and why seeds matter to us in general. My guest is a friend of mine, Randall Agrella, from Parsippity Farm in Fort Fairfield, Maine. He's a horticulturist and works for Baker Creek Heirloom and Rare Seeds. I think it's a great interview. He offers some great information to anyone who wants to start a garden, and even I learned a few new things. But before we start, I just want to uh, just give you a little update on what's going on around here. Uh, first of all, I hope you're well and you're all safe and practicing your social distancing and surviving as like being at home. I know some friends of mine who have children are, you know, would like to have them go back to school. But today, Connecticut just announced the governor that there will be no school for the rest of the year. So uh, some parents may be happy about that and some may not be, but whatever, we just roll with the punches. Now, I'm happy to report that my family is doing well. 
Uh, so far, we have, have no illness to report, uh, although we did have a bit of a scare with Katie a few weeks ago. Uh, she suddenly spiked a fever, and as it turns out, she had a bladder infection, which is something that happens frequently with her. I can deal with bladder infections, not crazy viruses. She's doing fine now, and I've been giving her some specially blended herbal tea to help get some extra fluids in her and also do a little bladder prevention as well. Uh, I did a deep dive research on some herbs that were good for bladders. So, so far so good. Fluids are important to keep flushing your kidneys and it doesn't hurt to throw in a couple of herbs to help minimize the bacteria that builds up in the bladder. Uh, We've been pretty good about our social distancing, which hasn't been too hard. Uh, The weather has been so crummy. Uh, For the month of April, we had more cold and rain days than we had sun. This past Sunday was the first time our temperatures were up in the 80s and we were able to take our daughter for a nice walk around our town green uh, for the first time since last fall. I don't know if you, many of you may or may not know, um, but our daughter has severe cerebral palsy and is nonverbal and is in a wheelchair and she has an extremely compromised immune system. And so we're very careful about uh, who comes into our home and where we take her out in public. Now, Sundays is usually uh, Katie days, as we call it, and that's when the weather is nice and it's not too hot and it's not too cold. And we take her out and we load her up in the car and we take her for a stroll around town or put her in a jogger, specially made jogger stroller for people with disabilities. And we take her for a hike um, as long as the trails aren't too bad. And uh, other times we will take a ride down to the Connecticut shoreline and and we'll find a boardwalk somewhere and we'll stroll along the boardwalk. Uh, she loves these outings. And yesterday she was all smiles and giggles in the back of the van. And she knew it was her day. In uh, my business news, well, for the most part, um, for well, for the first time in many years, farmers markets and craft shows are starting to cancel. This whole pandemic has really put a wrinkle in a lot of us who depend on craft shows to uh, support our families. Farmer's Market I attend is not opening this year and in today's paper it was announced that three fairs have been canceled in town fairs in our state. I do one large fair a year. It's a four-day fair and I do it in October and I'm expecting that to be canceled as well. So uh, at this time, I'm not going to find another market to vend in. Uh, Not all the markets are canceled. It's just the one that I go to. Obviously, there's no craft shows, but um, I'll still sell products online from my home. And it's just with Katie and all her medical needs and responsibilities, it's just too hard for me to be gone for days traveling around like a gypsy doing shows. You know, in January, I started a three-year advanced herbal course and I'm just going to take the time this year to really put uh, a lot of effort and try and get like 50% of the course completed in a year. Uh, This course is intense and there's a lot of coursework required to move on to the next units. So I'm going to be focusing more on that and get that over with. Uh, In addition, I want to create more online evergreen digital products uh, related to herbs and gardening that you can download. Uh, purchase and download or how-to classes. So we'll see how it goes. I mean, this year I'm also focusing on revamping a lot of the flower beds and continue to build the perennial herbs and medicinal flowers for my herbal inventory. I bought a ton of seeds, so I'm going to be start focusing on starting those seeds and building up my herbal apothecary out in the in the gardens. Um, I'll still grow vegetables, but it will be mostly for my own family consumption and for the herbal seasoning and teas that I blend and also sell locally. Uh, I still have fresh microgreens and other fresh herbs available, uh, but on a limited basis. Uh, The bath and body products and herbal teas and seasonings will be available, again, as I said, to purchase on a pre-order basis via the websites. All the bath and body products will be available nationally. I don't know, I have to look into it, whether shipping internationally... 
I have to look into that. Um, I think I can go up into Canada. You can also do the the books if you're international. The ebooks will be available to you. Paperback books that I make, those are all available to you through Amazon. Um, the latest book I just published was my uh, garden journal. That's available internationally on all platforms. Just look them up. They're Kobo Draft to Digital. It's an ebook version. So after speaking of gardens, again, I've been working in the greenhouse. I have lots of trays going at once. Yeah, I got tomato seasonings and a wonderful herb called skullcap, chamomile, and I bought some peppermint geraniums for little herbal room fresheners. Uh, geraniums are tropical plants. Uh, they do well out west. And in warmer, humid climates, they don't do well in Connecticut. I bought some rose geraniums last year. I bought six plants, and they didn't make it in the greenhouse. So I have to dig those up at the end of the year and bring them into the house and nurse them over the winter. Now that my kitty passed away, I can have catnip in the garden again. I have a couple catnip plants. Hopefully the neighborhood cats won't destroy it. But I couldn't grow catnip to save my life because my cats were in it. They were stuck. Owned all the time. Drove me nuts. Catnip's a great herb for upset stomachs, as a great herb for kids to take. Um, This makes a good bedtime tea. It kind of chills everybody out. Those are just some of the things that I'm starting. Soon they'll be ready to go out into the bigger raised beds once I'm done flipping them over and adding compost and mushroom inoculant. I'm just waiting for the weather as usual. The last frost date date to pass. We're still having overnight temps in the the 30s. My husband tells me that next week, northern New England, Vermont, Maine, New Hampshire, and northern Massachusetts are going to get some snow. Yippee-yay-yay. So as for my husband, he is working hard. He's the master of the perennial flowers. He has the most incredible touch. Uh, The yard's looking beautiful. He's been slaving in the yard for about a month, doing all the spring cleaning and prepping for the growing season. Uh, It's just, it's gorgeous. I took a picture. Of, a, of the yard today, even though it's cold out, um, the, some of the spring flowers are in bloom. The grass is nice and green, and he's done a nice job. And he's right now working on the back half of the other side of the house. All our property is behind the house, so if you look at the house, it doesn't look like much. Um, but all our property is behind us. He's out there, rain, shine, hot or cold. He's digging and cleaning out all the dried leaves that are stuck in the plants that blew in over the winter. He's pruning back plants plants for their new spring growth at the moment. He's in the lavender and he is cursing those plants to no end because they're just full of dried leaves and he has to get down on his hands and knees and clean every plant out. And now you do that times 300 plants plus all the other flowering plants that we have on the property and he's feeling the pain. In addition, he's replacing all dead plants and we're replacing them. We've already made one trip to the nursery so far and we have plans to go back for more. I'm looking for about uh, 20, 25 more lavender plants to add to our property. We have a lot of the uh, plants have died when we had some really bad winters where we had really hard frosts. Those polar vortexes, they, they just kill a lot of our trees and plants. It's really warm and then it just drops down to nothing. What happens is that the plants come out of a dormancy and when, when the vo- polar vortex hits, because the plants are not dormant, they're shocked and they died. And we've lost a couple of trees and several beautiful bushes. So we're replacing them with lavender. And then we have a nice, huge, giant mulch pile in the driveway. And he's busy working on that. Uh, All our lavender and flower beds have to be mulched. So it helps keep the weeds down and moisture during the driest parts of the summer. Uh, And then it's also right now dandelion, spring onion, and dead nettle seed. Season. So every evening he brings me a bucket uh, full <laughs> of weeds. <laughs> Wants to know if I want to clean them or keep them. You know, last weekend I made a weed frittata made of dried nettles, uh, dandelion leaves and roots, and wild onions. It it was really, really good. So I I joke with them. I said, you're never going to starve with me because I'll just go out in the yard and just, you know, harvest the weeds. We'll eat the weeds. Why not? Spring is always an interesting time. My neighbors, they just laugh at us as they see us digging up the front yard, pulling out all those dandelions. My husband is going to be sore for for 
another month or so as he finishes up with the spring cleaning, but he's almost done. So it, it pays off. The yards are beautiful once you uh, once he gets everything done and organized and mulched and weeded and reprepped and all that stuff. So before I start the interview, I just want to say that I had some technical issues with my mic. I was, uh, yeah, what can I say? I'm new at this. I don't know what I'm doing. It's a learning curve as always. I was wearing headphones so I could hear a Randall on the phone and I wasn't aware that the mic on the headphones, which I wasn't using for the interview, I was using a different mic, I was using a, a professional broadcast mic. I didn't realize that the mic on the headphones was on. And so you hear this scratching and popping and, and that's the microphone rubbing up against my shirt. So I apologize. I didn't know that it was it was going it was happening and i did try and engineer some of the sound out but again i'm learning the software there's about three different softwares that i have to use to produce this show i'm sure if some professional mixer would only use one program i have to use like two or three because i i'm i just don't know how the program works and how to get the results so i go to you know garageband to do this and then i go back to audacity to do that and then i use something else for something else um, I apologize. It's okay. You can still hear me. Randall talks, which is good. It's only, again, like I said, I'm learning. We all learn. We all got to stop somewhere. We'll get better as we move on. So as we start the interview, um, I just want to give a little introduction about Randall. Randa Agrella, he's a horticulturist and farmer, and along with his wife, Pam, they have a homestead in Fort Fairfield, Maine called Parsnippity Farm. You know, Randall also works for Baker Creek Heirloom Rare Seeds in Mansfield, Missouri, and knows a lot about seeds, starting plants, and gardening. Just a little background, uh, Randall, I first met Randall and Pam many years years ago when they were transferred here to Connecticut from Missouri to reopen and manage a centuries-old colonial seed nursery called Comstock Ferry in Wethersfield, Connecticut. And Comstock was an institution in Connecticut. I just do a Google search on Comstock Ferry. There's a ton of history and Baker Creek bought Comstock and then Pam and Randall were the managers who were going to be running the store. So they they came out to Connecticut. They were very warm and welcoming, and they embraced a lot of the local farmers and crafters and encouraged us to sell our products in their store. And Comstock just so happened to be the first wholesale account uh, for my herbal soaps uh, when I was first starting out. During the spring, they had a large agriculture fair and invited speakers from all over the country to give talks about gardening and related specialties. For years, I was one of many speakers who was invited to talk about uh, spin farming, which stands for small plot intensive farming, which is an educational program. It teaches new growers how to turn small plots of land, such as front yards and backyards, empty lots into commercial growing spaces. Then Randall and Pam found their dream farm in Fort Fairfield, Maine, and decided to leave Constock and move north to begin homesteading. So he, Randall still works for Baker Creek. He just doesn't run the store Comstock Ferry here in Connecticut anymore. And they're still open, but they've changed the format. I believe they still have seeds, uh, so, but it's more like a general store now. It's not a nursery seed shop that it used to be. And so I'm honored to introduce Randall Agrella. Randall, welcome to the show. Thanks, Brenda. Thanks for inviting me. Um, I uh, first got involved in horticulture uh, professionally in 2005 when I got hired at Baker Creek Heirloom Seed Company out of Mansfield, Missouri, and uh, was hired there to do uh, to pick orders and showed some aptitude and mm -hmm. uh, gradually worked uh, through various positions. I've been, been with them ever since, and the last six years I've been working remotely from my home in northern Maine, primarily giving horticultural advice, writing some catalog descriptions, and so on. And uh, at the same time, when we moved up here to northern Maine, our objective was uh, to create a self-sufficiency homestead on the three and a half acres that we purchased with a very old farmhouse, which we just love. And uh, that's what I've been doing ever since. Now, you... Um Fort Fairfield is really like north northern Maine. It's on the Canadian border. 
close? Am I correct? If my geography is correct? Your geography is spot on. Um, if you if you look at the big map of Maine, uh, you you see that northeastern corner where it kind of comes to a point. We are there. I actually uh, can can look across uh, the little valley outside of my front porch, and I can look into Canada. So, yeah, we're pretty far up there. We're we're USDA zone four, and uh, it turns into zone three just a few miles north of us. So uh, we're definitely uh, in the subarctic. So how do you? Uh... And you've got a small farm, so what what do you grow up there? Or does anything grow? I mean, you've got to have a really short season. We do have a pretty short season. We we can get frosts uh, right to the end of May, and, and they start again uh, pretty reliably about September 20th. So uh, what does that give us? About 100 days or 120 days. Uh, additionally, wow. it's been known to snow every month of the year up here, although we've never seen it, and we've never seen any you know, odd July frosts. Um, in six years, but sooner or later we probably will because they do happen. It's a very short season climate, and we try mostly to grow things that are well suited to the climate because we're trying to grow our own food, so we want it to be successful. And and what works for us is, of course, cooler season crops, uh, root root vegetables, uh, lettuce, all all the brassicas. They just grow fabulously right through the summer. What what are challenging are the ones that need real warmth, like tomatoes, peppers, and eggplants. Those. Some people succeed with them outdoors here. I have yet to figure out how um, because, well, we're in a very windy site, so that that may influence it too. We're we're at the edge of a huge potato growing area, and uh, the wind just whistles right down the hill from us uh, to us. But uh, so not very good on the warm season stuff. This year we're experimenting under uh, tunnels, trying Mm -hmm. to do a little better with, with those. Now, don't you have a greenhouse? Uh, the, the first and really only structure we've put up here so far was a little greenhouse. Uh, we built it ourselves 16 by 22 feet and, uh, he- heated with a wood stove. And uh, wow. that, that's, that helps hugely. I, we couldn't do what we do without it. Really. We also have, uh, quite a bit of grow light space in the house. Too. Mm-hmm. So have you thought about planting trees to kind of like break the wind from coming down the hill? Is that a possibility or you don't want to go there? No, we did that, and uh, we, we did that, I think it was our first, uh, probably our second spring here, so that would have been uh, five years ago, and and uh, uh, and they're starting to get to some size, but it's going to be a while before they really block the wind, though. Mm, mm-hmm. probably, probably another four or five years before they really grow together and give us a little bit of relief. Yeah, yeah. For new gardeners, you know, this is um, kind of international show, so, you know, in general, if someone... Considering the the virus and all the stuff that's going on, I've noticed uh, a lot of people are starting gardens this year. Seed companies are getting all kinds of emails, especially if I had tried to order seeds early in January. Usually when I do my big orders, um, I was starting to see a lot of websites uh, closing down. Uh, My microgreen company, they just shut down. They went out of their... They just shut for like a month and a half. They're out of uh, Oregon, I believe. So what if somebody wanted to start a garden, what would be some of the plants that you would recommend growing that are easiest? Your, say, top 10 uh, plants that you would recommend a beginning grower try. Sure. I would recommend uh, that they first and foremost take stock of what do they actually like and think that that they and their families will eat. Because uh, as gardeners, we very often get caught up in what we can grow and how we can grow it. And then uh, we bring something to the table and nobody will eat it. And that's that's probably the most disappointing thing we can have as gardeners if we're trying to grow food. So first step is figure out what what you like and and, uh, try to choose things that are an easy fit in your area. Uh, As a new gardener, don't don't mess around with a lot of things that are marginal in, in your area or that, that are going to need a lot of uh, fussing and babying. Just go with uh, what's going to be easy. And uh, 10 easy crops, um, probably bush beans, lettuce, um, peas. If you're going to grow peas, I'd recommend snap peas because you eat the pod too, and that gives you a lot more uh, harvest from the area. Uh, cucumbers and summer squash, kale. Uh, and then your, your root veggies, uh, carrots, beets, turnips, and uh, don't don't neglect a few herbs. They're fun to grow, and uh, it doesn't take much to uh, to be successful 
to the point where you're growing all of a particular herb that you need. And in, in a way, it, I find it more satisfying uh, to, to have only one or two things in the larder that I knew I'd have a whole year's worth of rather than, well, I, I grew three weeks worth of, of lettuce and now I'm done for the year. It's, uh, it's really satisfying in the wintertime to be able to go into your uh, stock of, of whatever it is that you grew and, uh, you know, and know that it's there and know that you grew it. It's great. The top 10 um, that you just listed off, some of them, I, you know, peas, lettuce, I guess my question would be, how would you plan somebody's garden? So we, as you and I know, um, we know the peas and lettuce are usually planted earlier in the season because they're, they're cool, loving plants. Mm -hmm. But what about, you know, so how would you plan something? Because not everybody... Everybody thinks, well, if I just plant lettuce and it's, you know, 120 degrees out, that lettuce isn't going to survive. So how would you structure your plan, your garden plan, as to when to plant stuff and, and the length of time it takes for them to grow to harvest? Well, after, after you've figured out what, what's a good fit as far as what you're going to want in the kitchen, uh, I recommend starting by familiarizing yourself with the needs of the crop. And there's, there's tons of resources out there. Um, Baker Creek sells a little thing called Clyde's Garden Planner, which is like a, a little cardboard slide rule deal that uh, you, you line up uh, your, your first frost date, uh, your last frost of spring or your first frost date of fall, whichever is relevant at the time. You line it up, uh, adjust it so that it reflects your area, and then it gives you a little calendar going forward and back of, of when you could uh, and, and should plant. Um, but familiarize yourself with the needs of the crop. Um, familiarize yourself with your environment. It's surprising how many people spend most of their lives indoors and they really don't have a clue of when the last frost in, in spring comes. Um, this is stuff that you need to know to be able to make a go of it. And then um, maybe make a little chart if uh, you know, or, or some notes. Maybe draw a little map if, if uh, space is tight or you're trying to squeeze as much in as you can and go from there. The other thing I would recommend is uh, start out small you're much better off succeeding with a small planting of something than failing with a really large planting. And sowing is the easy part. Keeping track of them all season long um, takes more perseverance. And surprisingly, a uh, harvest can really be a lot of work when you're successful. Uh, our first year, year here in Maine, we were storing all the squashes upstairs and we grew a lot of squash. And let me tell you, carrying 500 pounds of squashes up the stairs, that is a lot of work. <laughs> So you want to have some sense of, of where the produce is going to end up, too. Yeah. Do you have any of the plants that you recommended on your list? Would they be good for containers, growing in containers versus the ground? So if you're somebody who has like a deck or a patio, a small little porch patio, they're in an apartment building or they have a little little patio off their their apartment. Is there some plants that would do very well in, in containers? There are. First of all, any plant could be grown in a container, but it's a matter of uh, making sure that the container is the right size. Um, generally, plants that yield all season, like tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, uh, maybe cucumbers and summer squash, most of these are rather large plants, but if you have containers that are appropriate to them, uh, they will go all season long, and uh, you, you'll get a lot of yield out of them. One thing about container growing is, unless you have a ton of containers, it's not that easy to grow. You know, it, it, it make a significant dent in your overall food consumption. So you're better off just focusing on a few things that you like a lot. Okay, so let's talk about seeds. Where people should get seeds? There's uh, a big, huge movement: GMO, heirloom. Um, conventional, uh, there's all kinds of categories of seeds. What, what, why do seeds matter? Seeds matter because they're the basis of civilization. The, the planet cannot support 7 billion people without well-developed agriculture. Uh, so that's first and foremost, what, wherever the seeds are coming from or however we're getting them, uh, the supply is crucial. Um, in the matter of, uh, GMO versus, uh, conventional breeding, uh, I have always been very concerned with uh, genetic engineering. Um, I'm not, I don't think I'm as uh, rapidly opposed to it as some of the people that, uh, that I know are, but uh, I'm very much opposed to releasing genetically engineered crops into the environment where they can spread and contaminate 
uh, other crops or even worse, uh, wild species. So that's a big problem. Uh, at Baker Creek, we sell only heirloom open pollinated types, and that's all I grow. I don't think I've I don't want to say I've never grown a hybrid, but it was a long time ago. We like open pollinated because uh, with care, you can save the seeds and they will come back true year after year. And that's really important for food security because um, while hybrids have received a lot of hype ever since the 1950s, uh, they've been encouraged a lot, mostly by seed companies, frankly, and um, by uh, university agriculture uh, specialists that essentially are funded by seed companies when, when you get right down to it. Uh, hybrids are great for seedsmen because you can't save seeds and you have to buy it every year. Um, the, the problem is companies will drop lines if they're no longer interested in them, or especially in the last 20 years, consolidation in the seed industry, groups like Monsanto, buying up smaller seed companies for the express purpose of, of retiring their lines because they don't want the competition uh, with their own line. So hybrids... Are GMOs? Um, well, yeah, you know, we we live in such a um, messed up marketing world. Uh, when when the whole GMO issue first came to the awareness of members of the general public, people like myself and people like uh, Jared Gettle, who founded Baker Creek Seeds, and you know, there's other seed companies out there like this too. Uh, when, when this first came on the scene, we really didn't know too much about it, but um, actually I've lost my train of thought. What's the question again? We were talking about seeds and why seeds matter, and I, I asked you the question about hybrids. You were talking about hybrids and that you um, only grow open pollinated. So I see a lot of you know organic seeds that says they're hybrids. So my, I was a little little confused as to... You know, can you have an open pollinated plant that's a hybrid? Oh, okay, I know where I was okay. going now. Yeah, when we when we first started this, uh, we used the term GMO, genetically modified organism, a lot, and uh, the, we put out a lot of literature about it. And then I was at a, a mainstream uh, seed uh, seminar, I don't know, uh, six or eight years ago, and uh, they they were talking about sort of how to co-opt the whole thing and what what they discussed and and what has come into into practice is uh to say well uh any kind of plant breeding is genetically modifying and uh they're trying to blur the distinction between genetically engineered and uh naturally bred plants and uh so we're trying to move more toward uh just getting real specific and saying genetically engineered because they're not wrong i mean anytime you cross two somewhat different plants you've modified the genetics but uh they're trying to uh, to dissemble, you know, in, in in the mind of the public, to confuse so that uh, so that uh, they can continue to sell the products they want to sell. You know, mm -hmm. uh, we we like uh, so hybrid is a, a form of genetic modification, but it's still done by natural breeding. You take plants from two uh, unrelated lines, usually quite dissimilar, and you cross them experimentally. And uh, you, if you're a university or a plant breeder and you make hundreds and hundreds of crosses and you find out what you have to cross to get the result that you want. And then uh, those lines are tested and uh, the, the, they go into to production and, and they're marketed. We're talking about hybrids versus GMO versus, you know, open pollinated, the distinction between those. So while hybrids are technically GMOs, they're not really the ones we're worried about. Although as a consumer, you should be very worried about uh, something that you, you can only buy from one person because, um, as I said before, you know they, they'll eliminate lines from the market and then you're just stuck. You you can't you can't get it anymore. And now what do you do? You, you've got a favorite uh, you know eggplant that you've been growing for 15 years and suddenly you can't buy it. Um, mm -hmm. th this will happen with, with open pollinated too, uh, but the difference is if it was open pollinated, it's a true breeding line. You could save your own seed and, uh, and have that line forever as long as you want mm -hmm. it. And that's really important for food security because, you know, as we've seen recently, uh, we're all at the whim of the market and uh, you just never really know what's going to happen. And I, 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 I just like a little bit of security. I, I like knowing that... Uh, you know, that if I have a favorite crop, I, I can grow it as long as I want to grow it. Is there a seed shortage or the reason why gardeners can't find 
you know, seeds at the moment is because the market is, you know, everybody decided to buy seeds at once. Mm. Or is there an international seed shortage at the moment? Well, I don't think there was a shortage. Whether it's a true shortage now or not, yeah, there probably is. Um, at, at my company, we've we've seen sales go up by ten times overnight. And uh, you know, these are crops that uh, you you plan one year to grow the next year and and sell the seeds the following year. So um, I don't think the real shortage has actually happened yet, but I wouldn't be surprised if it does. But but there's an effective shortage. Uh, you know, everybody's so backed up with orders. And uh, well, like for example, at where I work, in one day we got ten thousand orders, and and typically a, a good day for us was one thousand orders. And uh, wow, you know, when you suddenly have nine thousand more orders to fill, and at the same time you're looking at stay at stay at home shelter in place orders, and uh, now you can only have three people in a workstation where you had five before. It gets pretty gnarly, and, and all the seed companies were affected like that. The, the other thing it gets into is how seeds are supplied, and uh, the way it works in the seed industry is there's wholesalers and there's retailers. Of course, that's true in all industries, and uh, the retailer is the one who's responsible for having it there when you want to buy it today. Uh, the wholesaler mm-hmm. is just responsible for getting you a few pounds of it sometime. <laughs> so... So very often you 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 can't you can't just place an order with the distributor and you know ten days later you get your seeds. It's it's not like Amazon. Uh, mm-hmm. You know it mm-hmm. it can take three months to to get an order filled, and 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 they are probably deluged with orders from seed companies just like we're deluged with orders from cu- from retail customers. You know it, it goes right up the line. I can only imagine what it's going to be like when when it gets to the level of uh, who's growing them, when and uh, and and how. You know. Yeah. So does the quality of seed matter? When I walk into a big box store and I see their wall of seeds, how do I know that those are quality seeds versus, you know, going to Baker Creek, which is primarily an online uh, retailer, right? You used to have store. Well, you do have stores. You Connecticut's closed. Or don't, no, Comstock is still open, right? As far as I know, Comstock, well, I don't know if they're open during the crisis, but they had been open up until then. And uh, and we we had our seeds in there, and and we've got the seed bank in Petaluma, and they're currently closed, and and our seed store in Missouri is also closed. Right right now, we're strictly online. Online, okay. So how do you know the difference? If some as a beginning gardener, how do I know that you know I really should be going to a quality seed company versus you know going to some of these other companies um, that I don't want to name. Um, and get their seeds. How do you know? Well, uh, you you really can't know. You 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 can you can. I would recommend first of all that that you look at how the seeds are being handled in the store. Uh, to cite two examples, my my local grocery store up here. Uh, you know, every, every grocery store you know offers a few seeds, I think. Um, but in this particular store, they keep the seeds in the atrium between the glass doors and and the windows. Uh, you know. Where, where you walk in before you're actually in the store and uh it gets very hot in there so i would i would be skeptical and and then another example would be uh at, at walmart the seeds are being kept uh, out in the greenhouse rather than indoors now so again very hot you you want to hope that the seeds were handled carefully so at, at least check that and then beyond that you're really pretty much stuck with uh brand names as far as who you trust and who you don't one thing you can look for in labeling is uh, if you want to avoid hybrid seed, don't buy anything that says F1, of course, or if it says hybrid, obviously. But a lot of times it doesn't say hybrid. It'll just be a, a plant name and it'll say F1. That F1 or F2 designation shows you that it is a hybrid and it's not something you could save seed from and uh, get get a true crop the following year. Other than that, uh, you're, you're pretty much at the mercy of the seller. So when you find a, a source that, that you trust, uh, you, you keep working with them. So if I walk into a store, their seeds are in the doorway or in the atrium where it gets really hot, then take a pass. Yeah, because you don't, you don't want seed that uh, that has been stored badly. You, you might also want to look at the dates. Um, there, there are laws probably in most states, but, uh, you know, it's been known to happen that they put last year's seeds out again this year. And okay. that's not such a bad thing uh, if they've been handled well. And you, and at home, you can store seeds and have them last, you know, comfortably for five years, or you mm-hmm. can really have them last forever in the freezer. But uh, if uh, 
you know, if they just stuck them in a back room and then put them back out the next year, that's not too promising. Okay. So you look at the back of the seed package um, and it tells you the date. So you really want last year's seed. Yeah, you really want this labeled for this year, whatever the current year is, yeah. What plants would you say should be purchased and what plants would be perfect for seed? I know I hear a lot of people at the farmer's market, I grow a lot of lavender. I have over about 300 plants of lavender, but I didn't start those from seed because they're impossible to start. And I do not recommend people starting Mm -hmm. lavender plants from seed because they're cuttings. What plants do you suggest that people not try and start? I know parsley is a, is a great herb. It's a bitter herb, um, but it takes forever for, the, for parsley to germinate. Um, and the, it likes cooler, damp weather, and it's a biannual, I believe. So what, what do you mm-hmm. suggest people do? Well, uh, the only ones that really need to be started indoors or to be purchased uh, are the ones that take longer than what you have in in your summer climate. Um, Tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, uh, pretty much a given. Even though they're not particularly hard to start, they can be started indoors readily enough, but people Mm -hmm. aren't really in the habit of doing that. Um, And then then we've got newer growers that are kind of winging it as they go, and uh, they want to start everything from seed indoors. And there's a lot of plants where it's either not worth the bother to do that or the plants just don't tolerate it. Um, for, for direct seeding outdoors, I, I would go uh, certainly with any uh, larger seeded plant because they tend to grow quickly. That would include, you know, squashes, melons, and cucumbers and so on, uh, beans. And then uh, pretty much any root crop, you're probably better off not starting uh, in containers, but just direct seeding right out in the garden. The uh, nursery the other day, they had started corn in, in as seedlings. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not that you can't do it. And, and there there certainly might be occasions where it's worth doing that. But uh, as a general rule, if you're growing crops that are suited to your area, most, you know, the, the bulk of what you're going to use in the kitchen. Mm-hmm. Now, what's the definition of direct seed? That is where you sow the seed right into the ground, right where it's going to grow. You, you have no plans of moving it or transplanting it. It's, mm-hmm. it's going to live its life right there. Because some people, they don't understand what, you know, look at all the packages. And it says sow seeds directly into the ground. and But technically, they really would be better sown in a container prior and started indoors. Um, well, no, I, I think I'm saying just the opposite. A lot of people want to do that. And uh, a lot of times it, it really isn't uh, worth the effort or you know the space that it's going to consume indoors or just uh, or it's just not good for the plant so what do you grow we talked touched a little bit about what you do what do you what are your crops on your little three acre little your three acres um there's no such thing as a little farm not not (laughs) not when you're out there trying to keep the weeds (laughs) under control no you're quite right about that um well when we moved up here uh, you know, our, our main goal was subsistence farming, but we were also looking for a place where we could, you know, run our online business because uh, we do sell starts in the spring. And uh, what we have done here is uh, we have our veggie gardens and we do uh, seed production. Uh, uh, we grow seeds for Baker Creek Seeds and for the Roughwood Seed Collection. William Ways Weaver, his outfit out of uh, William Ways. Ways. W O Y S Will Will Weaver. I'm pretty sure you've met him. I he's he's he was at a couple of the Comstock uh, events hmm. when when I was running the store. I don't remember. I'm sure. I'm sure we. I I'm sure I did meet him, but I don't. I don't remember him. So he has his own seed company. Uh, he he inherited a seed collection from his grandfather, and he's a food historian and and traveler. So he's been maintaining it and adding to it over the year and. Uh, I don't even actually know if I'm getting paid um, for the seeds that I grow for them, but it doesn't really matter. Uh-huh. I mean, I could have asked. Um, I'm just happy to be helping conserve some some of the really really rare stuff. So we so in our on our farm we've got subsistence farming. We've got the seed crops, uh, and then we do the plant starts for sale, which we sell online and locally. Uh, and then uh, we planted mm-hmm. a lot of fruit trees, uh, which which actually. Be, People need to visualize how exciting it is when, when a fruit yeah. tree comes into bearing. 
because you buy this little stick and you put it in the ground and uh, it doesn't look too promising maybe the first year and you worry about is it going to survive the winter. And So what kind of fruit trees survive in northern Maine? We do pretty well with uh, everything except uh, the the stone fruits, you know, peaches and, and uh, apricots. Actually, I misspoke because plums do very well up here. Apples primarily, they're, they're probably the backbone. And in fact, uh, there's naturalized wow. wild apple trees everywhere. You just, you just see them. Uh, and then, of course, blueberries. And then we like to experiment. Actually, this year we took a year off from uh, doing the retail thing for the sake of experimenting and uh, trying to get back to just the joy of gardening mm-hmm. without, uh, you know, production issues and uh, financial, you know, financial ramifications. Uh, also to develop our website and uh, experiment with new crops. What do you sell on your website? What we have been selling is mostly tomato, pepper, and eggplant starts. What kind of herbs? Uh, the, 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 mostly uh, culinary herbs at this point. So lots of different kinds of basil, you know, mm-hmm. oregano, parsley, and so on. When I first got into this uh, 12 or 13 years ago, I said to myself and probably to anyone who would listen, I, I said, how green can it be to ship tomato plants? You know, the, the day is going to come when uh, the local nurseries are going to be providing heirloom tomato plants. And then, you know, this is going to be a non-starter. And uh, we're there. And that's great. Pe- people don't need to buy tomato plants uh, through the mail anymore. They can go locally and get them. That's great. So part of what we're looking to do is uh, phase out most of that and just offer a few, you know, reliable top sellers that, that are going to do well for folks. And uh, we want to focus more on uh, herbs and uh, and rare plants. And so part of what we're doing this year is uh, allowing ourselves the time to grow things just for the joy of growing them, yeah, and also to see whether, uh, whether they're a good fit. So what's a rare plant? Oh, I'm doing some uh, different kinds of herbs this year, like prunella or self-heal. Um, that is a, an, a mint relative that uh, is a, a good healing herb. Uh, we've got we've got Moldavian balm, which is another one along those lines. We're, we're growing some Monardus. A lot of people mm-hmm. may have heard of Oswego tea, but there's which is one of the Monardus, but there's others. They're, they're really beautiful and they have uses. Uh, St. John's wort, whorehound, um, and also uh, we're looking to expand into selling cut flower locally or, or offering plants for cut flower. So we're doing a lot with uh, marigolds, snapdragons, cosmos, dahlias, status, bachelor buttons, and so on. Uh, we do get caught short a little bit on seed ordering like everybody else. We, we really, I had planned one more round of ordering uh, the really unusual stuff from mm-hmm. uh, like strictly medicinals. I think yep. they used to be called Horizon Herbs or that they may be two separate companies. Anyway, both of them and uh, adaptive seeds out of California for some really unusual stuff. But uh, we didn't we didn't get that far before uh, COVID hit. So we're not doing quite as many unusual things as we would like. But uh, the, the other the other thing we're trying to do is uh, we're trying to find landscaping plants, you know, that would be saleable, but also just for ourselves. Um, people are not mm. big on their yards in northern Maine. And, and I can understand that because it's not easy gardening country. But those that do look after their yards, you'll pretty much see about the, the same um, 10 or 12 plants in everybody's yard. And that's fine. They're pretty and they grow well. But uh, I just figure there's a whole huge palette of plants out there that aren't commonly grown. So part of what I'm looking to do is uh, find other things that, that would be nice. Yeah, did I see on your website that you also grow garlic and onions? You know, we've never quite gotten to the point of offering them uh, on the site. Um, but but we have offered them locally in the past. and. Uh, and probably we'll continue to do that. And, and that is that is one category that we would still like to add back to the site. Partially because there's a seasonal thing there. You know, it would give us sales at other times of the year rather than just in spring. Yes. Yeah. They, they grow fabulously well. What plants in general do you think new gardeners should stay away from? I would steer clear of anything that's not a good fit for your climate. And that, that really depends on where they are, you know. Um if if you're just starting out, j- just grow basic ones that are known to do well. My, I'm from Calif- originally from California. My, I was talking to my brother, and yeah, rosemary is is like growing like a weed, and he he has a, a neighbor, and it's growing under the fence. On my my brother's constantly doing battle 
with rosemary and i'm I'm salivating because i i would love to have that problem um my rosemary grows in my greenhouse because it doesn't survive connecticut winters the tropical plants you can't are your your desert plants western sage is a great medicinal herb i can't grow that yeah we we, uh we miss out on rosemary too but we we, uh we do have the greenhouse and uh, we we keep one or two stock plants alive in the winter. Actually, I've got a whole flat of rosemary plants that I started in late winter before we decided not to really do business this year. It's a fun one. We we love it. I love being able to go to any fresh herb and just grab a pink. So what have you been your failures? Well, the first year we moved here, we, we moved right at the beginning of summer. And uh, we, we made a preliminary trip with a truckload of, of our belongings and uh, our plants. <laughs> and... Uh, I basically didn't have anything ready for the for the garden up here, but what I did have was a lot of tomatoes and peppers, and uh, that was a pretty spectacular fail. I, I planted probably, between the two, I probably planted 20 or 25 varieties of plants that, that should work well in shorter season and, and cool season climates, and uh, really got very little from my canes. Do you have pest, uh, fungal issues up there? Uh, we, we we get a lot of powdery mildew in late summer on on crops that are susceptible, mostly on the uh, cucurbits. Um, pests, not not so much insects, with a few exceptions, because we're in an area where people don't garden that much, and and we're in an area where there's only a few commercial crops. And uh, of course, we're surrounded by thousands of acres of potato fields, so potato beetle is around. Uh, but uh, I I don't know that I've ever seen a squash bug. Mm. Because nobody grows it here, you know. So pests not too bad on on the insects, but uh, on uh, on the four footed, yes, raccoons mm. are terrible. Um, they decimated my corn that I was growing for seed uh, one year. Wow. I, I underestimated the the uh, you know the damage that they would do. Rabbits can be very harmful, although we have very few. Um, and uh, groundhogs, woodchucks. Wow. Or as we call them up here, whistle pigs. A lot of these <laughs> mammalian pests, you know, they'll go right down the row eating eating a row of seedlings. It it doesn't it doesn't hurt you too much if you lose a plant here or there, but uh, you know, when you lose everything all at once, and we have such a short season, a lot of times yeah. there's no there's no opportunity to replant. You know, we got we got one we got one window, and that's it. Do you have moose in your area? Do they come through? No, no. I mean, they're, they're reputed to. I've never seen one around here. In fact, I've hardly ever seen a moose in Maine, but uh, I know they're there, or they say they are anyways. Yeah. So gardening tips. What is the craziest gardening tip you've heard? And what are, you, what are your, some of your favorites that you would like to recommend? Uh, you know, I don't think any gardening tip is entirely crazy. And the reason I say that is because uh, all of them seem to work sometimes. It's just a matter of you know, was the success really caused by that or would it just have happened lately? Um, I think companion planting is very much overblown. Um, not not that there aren't good companions and bad companions, because there surely are. We we know that plants put root substances uh, back uh, through the roots back out into the soil. And uh, each kind of plant attracts its own little micro uh, ecology of particular soil organisms that do especially well in its range. And we also know that, uh, that uh, you know, plants can influence each other directly by what they put into the soil. But what I don't think is, I don't think it's well understood. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I think uh, I get a little nervous when someone starts ticking off a list of, of what plants are well suited for, for, for what plants and so on, you know, as companions, because I don't think a lot of it's well understood. You know, you plant your roses and your tomatoes together and they seem to do well. Mm-hmm. But was it because they were together or, you know, there could be other reasons. I don't think it's been uh, properly studied. So yeah. I think that one gets a little crazy. And uh, Well, the, the most common one is the three sisters, the beans, the corn, and squash. I think that one's well documented. It certainly worked for natives, Native Americans for, you know, thousands of years. Um, you know, that that one seems to work. Um, I, I guess... Uh, I guess the craziest one I've ever heard, and and this goes back a long ways. This this is not just from today's gardeners. Um, people that only plant this or that in, in relation to Easter, or 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 mm. uh, because because Easter can vary by a month. <laughs> yeah. You know, and you, you'll hear my grandfather always waited till after Easter to plant this or that, and I'm like, 
were they just, were they lucky? Did it just work out every time that the <laughs> weather matched where Easter was or <laughs> whoa? Well, in Southern California, by Easter, it's 104 degrees out, no. so you, know, <laughs> you should have started in January. No. Now, I hear May, Mother's Day, every safe to plant after Mother's Day, and I'm thinking, well, that's that's pretty far. That's pretty, you could technically start, I don't know, May for, I mean, we still haven't had our last frost here in Connecticut, but we're getting close. Yeah, and that's always the challenge, isn't it? Isn't it? When, when is the last frost going to be? I, I talk to a lot of home gardeners, uh, all different levels of expertise, because basically all I do at Baker Creek now is answer uh, cultural questions. and Garden gimmicks, what are the craziest uh, garden tips you've heard and what works and what doesn't, and what are your favorites? Well, my favorites, um, I'd say one of my big favorites is a holdover from back in the day when I was gardening on a very small scale. But part of what I've done is try to scale up my techniques uh, and, and work labor intensive on a larger scale. Um, well, one of my favorites is I, I like to either maintain nursery beds, which are special beds that you site close to where you're going to be able to keep track of them. You don't put them off at, at the edge of the garden somewhere. You put them right by the back door or right by the, the hose or something so that you will see them every day. Uh, mm-hmm. Nursery bed is a, is, is a special bed where you take care of little plants and then transplant them. And uh, and, and I like to do that. I actually learned that tip from uh, Mel Bartholomew's square foot gardening many years ago. The, mm-hmm. the idea being that uh, as a plant in the garden is done, you get it out of the way and you have another something to tuck in in its place. Okay. And I, I think you can probably make a garden pr- produce about double just by doing that as opposed to just only planting, you know, one time right in the spot where it's going to grow. I know it seems to conflict with what I said before, but of course I only do it with plants that, you know, are amenable to transplanting. So what plants aren't immune that you don't recommend transplanting? Uh, Beans and peas really don't like it. Sunflowers are not a fan. Um, Like I said earlier, most of the root crops, and and the reason why is not so much that they can't tolerate the transplanting, but uh, if you let a root crop uh, get root bound or even just the roots constricted in a pot, it can affect how how the actual you know potato or whatever turns out. Mm-hmm. I uh, I actually one year planted a lot of sweet potato starts that had been in pots too long, and when I dug them in the fall, uh, there was this one that that I dug up and there was literally a tuber in the shape of the pot. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so that was that. I mean, that's not so good. So when you answer horticulture uh, questions for Baker Creek, what are the what is the most common question that you hear? Uh, can you tell me why my plants didn't sprout? And and my okay. answer is no, I really can't because you have to tell me what, what plants they are and and what you did. And then maybe I can tell you. <laughs> it's, it's a problem of perception. New gardeners just aren't used to looking for the subtle details that, uh, that more experienced gardeners know to look for. It, it's not really a matter of green thumb, although people think that, that it is. It's just a matter of developing... Uh, you know, developing that perception. You know, I, I can spot from across the greenhouse, I, I can spot a wilting plant or I can notice when my tomato leaves are starting to get yellow on the lower leaves. I don't have to wait for it to become a crisis because my perception is attuned to it and I have the experience. I can deal with it right then. A new grower doesn't have that. So you, so, okay, so let's stop there with the tomatoes. Okay, so you see some yellow leaves at the bottom of your plant. I just take them off. Because I just pinch mm-hmm. them off. But what does that tell you as a horticulturist? It, it tells me one of two things. It, it, if it's early in the season, especially if it's a plant that's uh, still, you know, indoors or in its container somewhere, uh, it probably is just a hungry plant. Um, nitrogen is one of the three major nutrients that plants need. And it's the one that tends not to be available in the soil because it's mostly produced by biological processes. There's not like minerals in the soil that contain nitrogen. And uh, in a lot of gardens, the the organisms aren't there. They haven't been encouraged because people haven't been feeding the soil with a lot of, uh, you know, organic materials that develops a a healthy soil uh, microecology. Uh, Mm. The organisms aren't there. And, uh, and so the nitrogen isn't there, and 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 so and certainly the organisms are not there in a, in a potted plant unless you inoculate, which I do, but that's a whole other topic. Um, so yellowing lower leaves early on, just a simple lack of nitrogen. 
uh, later on when the plant's big, if, if you're in an area where uh, blights are known to occur, uh, there's probably there's several tomato blight, blights where, uh, you know, the first symptom is going to be the leaves dying from the bottom up. But they don't usually spend a lot of time yellow. They usually just shrivel up. So uh, mm-hmm. that's the difference that, that you have to look for. So it's earlier in the season, you want to add nitrogen. So compost, would you suggest compost or um, you know, some of the other fertilizers? Is there some a go-to? Um, well, there's a million different like things out emulsion? there. Um, uh, fish emulsion is what I use in, in almost exclusively on container plants, L- large or small, doesn't matter. Um, because my container plants are all seedlings. And when a plant's in active growth, that's when it's most likely to run short on nitrogen. A lot of people overdo mm-hmm. the nitrogen early on, and then it stimulates excessive growth and delays uh, flowering and fruiting. So, uh, for example, with tomatoes and peppers, there comes a certain point where you want to uh, reduce the input of nitrogen in favor of uh, the other two, which is phosphorus and potassium. But uh, mm-hmm. it, it, in the greenhouse or, you know, in containers, fish emulsion. Outdoors, I'll use fish emulsion uh, when I transplant or if I have a plant that I think is struggling. Um, I use a lot of purpose-made uh, packaged fertilizers these days because hardly anybody keeps livestock up here and manure is in short supply. But if I had mm-hmm. access to manure, that's what I would use. Compost is great. Um, but you should have added the compost when you when you work the soil before you planted the plant. It's not so much something that you would apply after, although you can, you know, you certainly can. But uh, you don't recommend top dressing around the yeah, plant. Yeah, you can do that. Um, it, anyway, the ones I use right now, I buy at my local box stores. There's Espoma brand. Uh, there's a couple others, and and uh, in recent years, the, you you can now get a hold of a lot of organic. Uh, materials like that, you know, right at your Lowe's or your Home Depot or your Walmart or whatever, where five or 10 mm-hmm. years ago, they weren't carrying as much of that stuff. So that's a good thing. Mm-hmm. All right. So wrapping up, um, what seed resources do you uh, recommend people check out? Uh, well, of course, Baker Creek Seeds, naturally. And uh, I, I'm also very partial to Southern Exposure Seeds and Victory Seeds. And then, then I mentioned uh, Horizon Herbs or stri- Strictly Medicinal adaptive seeds um there's a jillion small seed companies out there uh that would r- really feel the benefit if you know if people would order from them and uh mm-hmm. you, you you look at, the, at what they say about themselves on their site and uh you try to look for some associations like have they taken the safe seed pledge or uh are they members of uh you know organic seed alliance or whatever and uh you know that that'll usually tell you whether there's somebody you would want to do business mm-hmm. with or not well, I highly recommend medicinal herbs. I buy from them all my a lot of my herb plants. Um, in fact, I just bought my elderberries from them. We transplanted them the other day. I had them in the greenhouse, but they they've been great to work with. I like them. And another one I've used quite a bit is uh, sand mountain herbs. Sand sand mountain mm-hmm. herbs. They're out of Alabama. I don't I don't know of anybody that's got a better selection of uh, herb seeds. They're, they're amazing. Mm. Now, now, who's who's doing who's doing what right now in the, in the, in the uh, you know in the in the current supply issue? I don't know. I I suspect that a lot of the smaller ones didn't see the huge rush that that the bigger names did, and a lot of them are probably still doing business normally. Mm-hmm. Well, now that you mentioned several uh, herbs uh, seed companies, maybe they'll get a little a little plug, a little rush of of business. So. Um, All right. Well, I guess we're out of time. Is there anything else that you'd like to add? Oh, not specifically. I I would like to encourage, uh, you know, anyone who's interested in gardening to take it up and uh, don't be afraid to kill a few plants. I mean, we've we've all had a learning curve thing there. You know, just be observant and uh, try to learn as much as you can. Try to learn from other people's mistakes. And uh, where can people find you if they want to reach out to you? They could check out our Facebook page, Parsnipity Farm, and that's spelled P-A-R-S-N-I-P-P-I-T-Y, Parsnipity Farm on Facebook. Well, thank you so much, well, Randall. You. I appreciate it. So give my best to Pam. Thanks for doing this. I really appreciate it. Bye. Thank you so much, Randall, for taking the time out of your busy morning to chat with me about seas and gardening. 
And just to recap the conversation, I'll have notes about what Randall said in the show notes, as well as a list of my own list of the top 10 plants that I recommend for new gardeners in the show notes and links to all the websites and products that Randall mentioned in the show. So here's the recap of Randall's recommendations. Plant what you like. Don't grow vegetables that you're not going to eat. It's, it's a waste of energy and time. Pick plants that are easy to grow in your area. And if you don't know, ask someone who gardens, and I'm sure they'll be happy to help you. Even if you go down to the garden, your local garden center, they'll tell you what plants work well in your area. Pick plants that don't need a lot of babying or fussing over, and that's important. If you're just starting out, plant a few plants. Okay, so don't go crazy and plant everything because it's a lot of work. As Randall says, sowing is the easy part. It's the maintaining it over the growing season is the hard part. So just if you're just starting out, just pick a few plants and and start there. So Randall's top 10 plants for new growers is bush beans. Bush beans don't require trellising, just FYI. There's a difference between pole beans and bush beans. So he recommends bush beans, no trellising. Lettuce, snap peas, and remember he says because you can just eat the whole thing. Um, You don't have to open up the shell and pick out the peas. Cucumbers, summer squash, kale, root veggies such as carrots, beets, and turnips. And he says pick one or two herbs for the purposes of drying because there's nothing better than going into the cupboard and pulling out a nice, fresh, dried herbs that you grew in your garden the season before. Plants that will grow well in containers. He says, remember, pick the right size containers. So tomatoes, cucumbers, and summer squash can be grown in containers. Seeds. He says, try and buy open pollinated seeds. That way you can save the seeds following year. And learning how to save your own seeds is important. Our own food security in the country. And Baker Creek only sells open pollinated seeds. How to check for quality seeds in stores online. Um, If you're going into a store, he says, be observant about how the seeds are being handled, where they're being stored. If it's in a hot atrium, When you walk in the door and there's a glass in between and it's really hot in there, that's that's a good hint that those seeds are not going to be viable. So again, just remember seeds stored in hot, dry rooms diminish their ability to germinate. So you want to find seeds there in cool, dark places. He says, learn to know which brand names you can trust, uh, and that will require some research on your part. Go to their websites, see what they say about themselves, and he talks about the list. And again, we'll have this in the show notes as well. Check dates on seed packets. You want packets with this year's date or that current year's date. That means that the seeds were harvested the previous fall. So that's how you know that they're fresh. However, there is a caveat here. Home gardeners who store their seeds properly, so in a dark, cool place, those seeds will survive for about five years, and seeds that are actually kept in the freezer will last forever. Hybrids. If you want to know how to distinguish between a hybrid and open pollinated and GMO, seeds that indicate F1 and F2, those are hybrids. And you can't save those seeds to be used the following year. They're not open pollinated. So very rarely will you see the word hybrid on the, on the seed package. Randall's rule of thumb for starting seeds indoors, plants that take longer to grow in your current climate. So if you have a short growing season, he even has a shorter growing season than we do in Connecticut. He has 100 days. At least we have more than that. So things like tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, those should be started indoors. Plants that can be direct seeded outdoors in the ground are usually seeds that are big. So plants like squashes and melons and cucumbers, beans and root crops, they all have fairly large seeds. Stay away from growing plants that are not good for your climate. For example, trying to grow plants from warmer tropical climates 
in colder northern zones. And I think we talked about the rosemary. I love rosemary, but it doesn't grow in Connecticut unless it's being protected. So I grow it in my greenhouse. Banana plants. Some people grow banana plants. They're great out, out west or in the southern you know, tropical climates, but banana plants here in Connecticut and Common misconceptions. Randall says that companion planting is often overrated. There isn't any real data showing that companion planting actually works. So he he just thinks it's just luck that the plants do well. The other thing was planting on holiday dates. For example, Easter, the date moves from year to year and there's like a 30-day difference between the previous year and this year. So he's recommending you learn the date from the first frost to the last frost. So right now, I'm waiting for my last frost date to come up. Off the top of my head, I don't know it because I didn't look it up yet. But you can find those dates out. They're, look in the Farmer's Almanac, do a Google search, when's the, the frost dates. It's all scientifically laid out. So I just, what I do, my rule of thumb is I wait until the overnight temperatures are in the high 40s or low 50s. That's when it's consistent for two to three weeks. Then I know that it's warm enough to put tender plants outside that I'm not going to have to worry about frost. But right now, our temperatures are dipping into the 30s, still our predicted 10-day forecast. So I know that our frost date hasn't happened yet. And eventually I'll get around to looking it up. So garden gimmicks, maintain nursery beds, keep a small bed near the house and plant seedlings with the intention of digging them up and transplanting them into your larger garden when they're big enough or when the original plants die. So he just keeps a rotating bed and that bed is his nursery bed. So, and again, this is something I should be doing that I don't. Instead of starting the plants in trays and keeping them in the greenhouse, I should dedicate one of my beds to as a nursery bed and just use that for the babies. I, you know, you can divide these beds up into square foot, like M- Mr. Bartholomew, the square foot gardener does. He had, he just divided his gardens up into square foot squares and he would plant certain plants and he would just keep popping them out and rotating them. That's a good tip. I've heard of it before, but I don't do it. And this year I'm going to do it. Uh, What else did he say? Again, you can double your yield according to Randall when you do when you use a nursery bed for your seedlings. He just says, remember, root crops don't transplant well, so it's better to put them in a dedicated spot and just let them grow. Learn perception skills to identify problems in the garden. Uh, new gardeners need to learn how to look for subtle details of what the plants in the garden are telling them. You know, you have to be observing. You have to develop those observation skills. For example, he says that he can walk into his greenhouse and he can spot uh, exactly what's wrong with a tomato plant clear across the other side uh, of the greenhouse if it has yellow leaves. Uh, he says the lower leaves um, that are yellow, and, and what does that mean? And he says if it depends on what time of season it is. If it's young, early in the season, probably the plant needs some nitrogen, some fertilizer. If it's later in the season, that might mean that there's a blight problem. And, and tomato blight is common across the uh, the United States. I, I'm not sure about the world, but it is a big problem, especially here in New England. We can have a rainstorm come through with high winds um, and, you know, with tornado warnings, and it can decimate an entire field of, of tomatoes because the blight is on the wind. And it gets blown. And so you can have one tomato plant can decimate acres, 40 miles of tomatoes. So blight's a problem. So he's saying, you know, usually what happens is that the plant, the leaves at the bottom, if you've got blight, will shrivel up uh, from the bottom and keep going up the plant. That's why a lot of farmers grow their tomatoes in greenhouses. So they don't they can protect them from the blight. And as a side note, in my 
my latest book that I just published, my garden journal, there are sections in the journal pages where I ask questions and you just fill in the blanks. And the, the purpose of those questions and comments is to teach you your observation skills uh, of how to learning how to identify them. And you just, you can either pull those uh, pages out of your journal and you save them for the next year. So when you go back, you have a record of what you planted and how well did it do on issues um, that you may or may not have. But yes, you have to develop those observational skills. You have to be a good garden detective. And that's the fun, is just going out there and figuring out what's going on. Okay, soil amendments. He says, don't overuse nitrogen early in your seedling process. It stimulates a lot of leaf growth, but gives you very little fruit later. And at a certain uh, point in the growing season, you're going to need to reduce your nitrogen and in favor of, of adding phosphorus and potassium so the plants will fruit. He recommends adding compost at the beginning of the season when you first start working your beds and flipping them over. For fertilizer, he, he recommends fish emulsion and uses it exclusively uh, in all his containers. Espoma Brands, which is Plant Tone, Garden Tone, Rose Tone, that brand, there's a ton of them. I believe he's referring to the Garden Tone, and we use that here on our property, and I have to say it's a great product. I use the Fish Emulsion, the Plant Tone, Garden Tones, and also Mushroom Inoculation, and I'll talk about that another time. That's a whole other separate topic. Randall's recommended seed companies, of course, Baker Creek Heirloom Seeds, uh, Southern Exposure Seeds, Victory Seeds, Adaptive Seeds, Strictly Medicinal, and Sand Mountain. And he also recommends that we support mom and pop seed companies and that we give them a try and that we try and support them, uh, mainly because of food security reasons. Uh, we don't want to end up having to buy our seeds from one company. You know, we'll all starve. If we don't have seeds, we'll starve. And we need the open pollinated seeds. You start uh, buying exclusively F1, F2 seeds, we're not going to be able to feed ourselves. We, we can't be dependent on one company providing all our food for us. Thanks for listening. I hope you got something out of this interview. And if you have questions or you want to connect with Randall, you can find him on Facebook at Persnippity Farm. And again, I'll have links in the show notes for his Facebook page. Click on over and say hello to him. For my book, if you're interested in getting my latest book, my garden journal, a how-to garden book for kids. And it's just not for kids. It's for adults too. There's lots of information. It is available on all online retailers in paperback and ebook formats. Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Kobo, Draft to Digital. The books are on there. Ingram Spark. You can also get them on Ingram Spark. I also have a ready to print downloadable version. All you need to do is just click the PayPal button. You pay, you fill out the information, and like magic, it pops up on your computer ready to print. You can find that downloadable print version on my author website, which is Brenda J. Sullivan Books. It's B-R-E-N-D-A-J Sullivan, S-U-L-L-I-V-A-N books b-o-o-k-s dot com you can just click on the picture of my garden journal and scroll down to the bottom of the page and you'll see a paypal button for download and just follow the links uh, coming up next uh, podcast i'm continuing our garden talk with another friend of mine uh, she is a gardening expert her name is betty lou sandy she is a wealth of information, and as you will hear, she blows my mind with a gardening trip and uses for growing potatoes. Uh, leave it to, to Betty Lou to find 
something crazy to do in the garden. Uh, she's great. She's been teaching at the college for a long time, uh, and she's semi-retired at this point. It was a great interview, and I hope you'll join us and take a listen. So in the meantime, thanks for listening, and I'll see you next time. Hi everyone, it's Brenda again. Just a few more things before you take off. On Fridays, I'll post a quick newsletter called Five Herb Friday, sharing five things related to the world of herbs. It could be a cool recipe, a cool idea for using herbs around your home, a DIY bath and body product, a gadget, a book, or an article or website I found helpful and think you might enjoy it too. It will be short, to the point, and full of good positive energy that will send you off for an awesome weekend. So go to livingandlovingherbs.com and sign up for this short email. This episode was brought to you by farmtobath.com, where our bath and body products are inspired by nature. Farm to Bath makes beautiful handcrafted goat smoke soaps, body room sprays, sugar scrubs, salves, balms, and body oils using the herbs, flowers, fruits, and vegetables grown in our garden. There are no preservatives, additives, dyes, or fillers. We use sustainable growing practices that are chemical-free and GMO-free. This is just for our listeners of Living and Loving Herbs podcast. We're offering a buy one, get one free on our goat's milk herbal soaps. This offer is only for our podcast listeners. Just type in the promotion code LLH podcast at checkout. The code again is LLH podcast. Go to farmtobath.com and check out our products and don't forget to order your soap. Until next time, have a happy and blessed day and thank you for listening.